first item of business is portfolio questions on communities, social security and equalities. And we begin with question number one from Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, of the Scottish Government what action it will take to support a national campaign to raise awareness of disability and reduce stigma in the light of a recent report by Disability Agenda Scotland. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you. I welcome the publication of Disability Agenda Scotland's report and last week we published A Fairer Scotland for Disabled People in which we committed to delivering a One Scotland campaign in 2017 to reduce stigma. The focus of the awareness campaign will be on employment, which was also a key theme in Disability Agenda Scotland's report. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Minister for her response? Currently, only 43.8% of individuals with disabilities in Scotland are em employed, compared to 72.3% of the wider population. Employment rates have actually fallen in recent years among some disabled groups. The DASH report acknowledges that disabled people still do not feel equal, and while there are nice words and documents that aim to improve further matters are simply not happening. This is simply not good enough. Can the Minister confirm what this Scottish Government will do to get employers to treat disabled people with, as we do the wider population? Minister. Thank you very much. In the disability uh, delivery plan that I just mentioned, we are making a commitment to reduce the employment gap in Scotland by one half and to consult with uh, public agencies and local authorities to set a target for public sector employment. I fully intend that we will do a great deal better than the UK government where the recent all-party parliamentary group report on disability highlights that it will take the UK government till 2065 to meet their target of halving the employment gap for disabled people if they go at their current slow pace, a bit like welfare benefits. We will specifically, in addition, work with employers in Scotland to ensure that they uh, take advantage of the UK Access to Work Fund, making sure that disabled people seeking employment are aware of that fund and are assisted and advised on how to make application to it. Agrees with me that one way to reduce stigma experienced by those with disability is for the Tory Westminster government to treat people with dignity and respect, to not threaten to reduce their incomes by slashing disability benefits, and to stop imposing draconian benefit sanctions on some of the most vulnerable in our society. Minister. Yes, I do, of course, agree, and I find it very disappointing that our colleagues to my left, although clearly not there politically, insist on groaning every time we mention exactly the damage that the UK government is doing. And indeed, yeah. let me quote another report, the National Audit Office, which pointed out that the sanctions regime is costing 285 million, while still producing only a saving of 132 million. And they also suggest that their analysis uh, points out that the DWP's uh, sanctions uh, approach has very weak evidence to support it. So any notion that sanctions, reducing benefits, encourage people into employment, as opposed to what we know for a fact, which is that they increase poverty amongst those individuals, is of course false. And our colleagues in the Scottish Tory party can continue to try and uh, support and promote that policy by the UK government, but it's dismantling by the minute, and the public is becoming very well aware of that. Yeah. Question number two, Maurice Corrie. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the Audit Scotland report titled Local Government in Scotland, Financial Overview for 2015-16. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. Signing officer, the Scottish Government considers the Audit Scotland report to be a fair assessment of the financial position of local authorities in Scotland. The report highlights the pressures that councils, like other parts of the public sector, face, but also identifies that despite those pressures, councils are continuing to deliver improvements to services and that the pressures are approximately the same as the reduction in the Scottish Government's total budget over the period 2010-11 to 2016-17. The report makes a number of recommendations aimed at helping councils to meet future pressures 
We welcome the report and would expect all uh, local authorities and councillors to consider and take any necessary action to implement its recommendations. Maurice Corey. I thank the Minister for her reply. Um, the crucial detail in the report was that councils are starting to use their reserves to fund services. 13 did so in 2015-16, and more will do so in the next few years. That cannot continue. Audit Scotland says that, I quote, they are concerned about councils' slow progress in delivering services differently rather than relying on incremental savings to existing models of service delivery, unquote. Does the Minister agree that the current situation is unsustainable and what specific actions will the Scottish Government take to help councils have that sense of ambition that Audit Scotland say is necessary to adapt? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Accounts Commission, uh, in terms of the overall financial health of local government, uh, came to the view that it was generally good. They did reflect that there was a slight increase in the overall reserves uh, within the, the, the gift of local authorities with a, a reduction in overall uh, debt. Uh, nonetheless, the report uh, identifies significant challenges that lie ahead and the need for local authorities to consider uh, how they work to deal with uh, the challenges ahead. Um, that, of course, underlines uh, the importance uh, of public sector reform. Uh, it is no secret that, that this government uh, and indeed COSLA uh, are of a, a shared view that how we do business uh, will have to be different uh, and that we will have to continue uh, on this journey to, to reform public services, to uh, make the public pound go further, to improve outcomes for communities, but also crucially uh, to ensure that communities uh, are more involved in decision making and the allocation of resources. Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that the reduction in real terms funding of councils since 2010-11, which is proportionately the same cut in the Scottish Government's total budget over the same period, is due to the continuation of the UK Tory Government's failed austerity agenda? Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, of course I would agree with that, President Officer. It is clear that uh, local government has been treated uh, fairly despite the cuts to the Scottish budget uh, from uh, the UK government. Local government uh, finance settlements were maintained in Scotland on a like-for-like -like basis uh, over the period 2012-16 to with extra money uh, for new responsibilities and taking into account the addition of £250 million to support the integration of health and social care. Uh, the overall reduction in 2016-17 funding equates to less than 1% of local government's total estimated expenditure in 2016-17. Alec Rowley. I think we're, we're, we're right to um, point out where failed Tory austerity is damaging Scotland. But Regardless of who's to blame, I would argue the government have disproportionately cut local government. But regardless of that, I think the big question that local government workers are asking, that people across Scotland is asking, is what is this parliament going to do about it? We saw this week the president of COSLA, David O'Neill, warn that up to 7,000 jobs could go, £500 million. And given the cabinet secretary has a brief that covers inequality, poverty, and all the work that she and her ministers are trying to do. Has she or will she agree to have an impact assessment carried out of the cuts that are going to take place across local government and who will be impacted from those cuts? Cabinet Secretary. So, officer, of course, there is uh, an equality impact assessment uh, done on the government's budget uh, as a whole. But the crucial thing that we have to recognise is that local government have had the same reduction in their funding as has been imposed uh, on the Scottish Government uh, by Westminster. Uh, and I'm glad that Mr uh, Rowley, uh, unlike our colleagues uh, to, to the left, uh, recognises the impact uh, of Westminster austerity, because the impact of Westminster austerity 
isn't just in a reduction of financial resources to this place uh, and therefore uh, to our partners in local government. It also has uh, other impacts because I'm conscious uh, for local government in particular that they will have, as a result of austerity, an increased demand uh, on their services. Uh, and of course, it's this government uh, that is having to uh, continue to, uh, where possible, mitigate against the very worst aspects uh, of austerity, such as welfare reform. Question number three, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met COSLA. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, Ministers regularly meet with COSLA to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government uh, to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. I last met with Councillor O'Neill on the 1st of December and my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution, uh, met with the COSLA group leaders on Tuesday the 6th of December as part of the series of meetings to discuss the spending review and the forthcoming 2017-18 local government finance settlement. Edward Mountain. I thank the Minister for that reply. Um, two weeks ago, it's reported that COSLA has withdrawn from negotiations over the increase of local taxes used for central policy aims. That followed COSLA's view, and I quote, there is a clear and honourable link between taxes raised from local households being spent on local services. And this has been a Scottish tradition for generations. The Scottish Government will destroy that link. Does the Minister agree with COSLA or does she believe they're wrong? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I certainly don't agree with uh, Mr uh, Mountain and his characterisation of the situation. As I said in my uh, original answer to Mr Mountain, uh, that uh, my, my colleague, uh, Derek Mackay, uh, only this week uh, met with the COSLA, COSLA group leaders to discuss uh, the, the forthcoming financial settlement. Uh, and Mr Mackay has repeatedly uh, put on record, as have other uh, ministers, that, for example, all council tax uh, collected by each local authority will remain uh, with each local authority uh, and that any uh, additional revenues uh, that they raise from the unfreezing of the council tax, that again, that, that will uh, uh, remain with local authorities. Question number four, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government when it last received an update from COSLA or the Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers regarding the enforcement of minimum standards for gypsy traveller sites. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, there is no requirement for COSLA or the Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers to update the government on progress towards meeting the minimum standards for gypsy traveller sites. However, uh, the Scottish Government has met with uh, COSLA uh, and ALICO officials to discuss issues around sites, including site quality, and will continue to do so. Fee. Across Scotland, there are numerous examples of minimum standards still not being enforced at gypsy traveller sites since the Scottish Government published its guidance in May 2015. For example, Dunhalgan gypsy traveller site near Loch Gilpet, a site which I have visited, despite residents raising numerous concerns over lack of basic provisions for years, no action has been taken and no progress has been made to improve their very poor living conditions. The Dunhalgan site lacks adequate lighting, the road is still in an extremely poor condition and the site has no bus stop. It is clear that the current enforcement strategy is failing as the concerns of residents are being ignored and improvements have been minimal at best at many sites. Will the Minister take responsibility and control of the situation and implement an inspection programme of all gypsy traveller sites in Scotland to ensure that drips, gypsy travellers do not have to continue to live in substandard conditions on sites which are failing to provide basic provisions and failing to meet minimum standards. Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, I thank uh, Mary Fee for, for her question. Uh, if I can reassure her by saying that uh, Kevin Stewart, the Housing Minister, has uh, written to her Gowan View uh, with reference to the, the sites that she mentions. Uh, in terms of the, the broader work that the government is doing, uh, we will review progress towards implementing uh, the standards uh, with site tenants, site providers and other key stakeholders uh, during 2017. Uh, we have said that we expect uh, sites to meet the standards by the 30th of June uh, 2018. 
and we are also considering uh, linking uh, the guidance to the Scottish Social Housing Charter, uh, which we consulted on recently, uh, and that appears to have been uh, well, well received. Um, Obviously, the purpose of the Scottish Social Housing Charter is to improve uh, the quality of services uh, received uh, by uh, all members uh, of the community, and that will give some opportunities uh, for clearer statements and clearer clarity in terms of what tenants, including uh, the Gypsy Traveller communities, uh, what they are entitled uh, to expect. And I hope that including the site standards uh, in the Charter uh, indicates the seriousness of which this Government takes uh, the issue of standards, of poor standards, on Gypsy Traveller sites. Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I thank Mary Fee for raising this uh, particular question? Uh, as a member of previous member of the Equal Opportunities Committee, this was always high in our agenda, and in particular, uh, the relationship between local authorities local communities and gypsy traveller sites as well. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, therefore, that what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure ongoing cohesion with local communities, local authorities and gypsy traveller sites? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, this is uh, an area that the Scottish Government works very closely with uh, COSLA on. It is a, a joint aim of the, the Government and COSLA to ensure cohesion between gypsy travellers and uh, the settled community. There are a number of aspects uh, to this, uh, including the revised guidance on unauthorised uh, sites, which will set out responsibilities uh, both for the gypsy traveller community and uh, local authorities. It is important that we also emphasise the contribution that Scotland's gypsy traveller communities has made to our national life, and we will include this uh, in the strategic programme of work which we'll publish uh, during 2017 also. And we are working to uh, better identify uh, better practice in community cohesion work uh, using the results uh, to inform better collaborative approaches uh, with our partners right across the public and third sector. Uh, and finally, President Officer, uh, we'll also explore ways to support public bodies in implementing the fostering good relations element of the public sector equality duties uh, with regards to race equality and community cohesion. Question number five, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to amending the descriptors for the activity moving around which are used to assess personal independence payments. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you. We, we have, as the member knows, carried out an extensive consultation exercise to help inform our approach to Social Security in Scotland, and we will publish our report on the consultation responses early in the new year. Those consultation responses will help to inform the work of the Disability and Carers Benefits Expert Advisory Group, which we will be establishing, and that group will provide recommendations and guidance uh, to ministers on eligibility criteria, on assessments and disabilities, and the conditions it should be given an automatic or a lifetime award. Richard Lyle. I can thank the Minister for that answer. As the Minister may be aware, presently the descriptor requires people to stand and then move more than one metre, but not more than 20 metres, either aided or unaided to be considered for the mobility scheme and other support. This descriptor at present is causing a loss of provision to many people in my constituency. Can I therefore ask what further changes the Government intend to make to deliver a fairer, people-centric social security system rather than what the Tories are doing in our communities when we have the power to do so. Minister. Thank you. Uh, I, I can assure the member that I am aware of the change that has been made in terms of uh, that descriptor, not only um, in my work as a minister, but obviously as a constituency MSP. I've had many uh, constituents come to me uh, and explain in, in detail the uh, significant uh, distress and subsequent hardship uh, that that has caused to them. Now, we've been clear from the outset that our social security system will be an investment we collectively make in ourselves and in each other, that the system will have embedded throughout its operation the key principles of dignity, fairness and respect. And we've also been very clear that to get that right, we need to uh, build the system from the ground up. So to continue uh, our commitment in that regard, uh, to build this system on the foundation of both real lived experience 
and expertise. In January, we will launch the recruitment exercise for 2,000 volunteers to join our experience panels. Those volunteers will be drawn from individuals who currently receive one or more of the 11 benefits that will be devolved to the Scottish Government, and they will work with us long term to help us make the right improvements and the changes that are needed to every aspect and detail of how our system will work, including uh, where assessments are done. Let me also be clear, though, that it is our view that the approach that we will take will ensure fewer assessments, improved decision-making, greater lifetime and long-term awards, and all of that based on evidence, as opposed to what appears too often to be the case uh, as subjective opinion. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister if she is considering um, the removal of the private sector from a new um, Scottish disability benefit assessment process and that these assessments be purely run by a public sector agency? Minister. Thank you. Can I thank Mr uh, Griffin for his question? Of course, that question about how assessments would be done where uh, we think that they are necessary is part of that consultation exercise and it would be contradictory of me to argue that we build a system from the ground up and we listen to what people tell us to now make a decision about how we would conduct assessments in advance of that consultation exercise and those 500 responses being properly analysed and us being able to see uh, what those consultation responses say to us. We do have in Scotland a, a public sector a provider who uh, has some input into uh, the assessment process, but we'll make the decisions about what the assessment should be, how many of those we think we would actually need, how they would be conducted, um, primarily on the basis of the evidence that we receive, but also in that building from the ground up exercise that I've already mentioned and will, of course, inform Parliament in due course of the approach we intend to take. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government, as of next year, will have legislative power over a number of benefits, including those associated with extra costs of living with a disability. What consideration has the Scottish Government given to further devolving disability benefits at local level, either to health boards, local authorities or new partnerships, to allow for personalised care packages? Minister. Well, of course, as uh, Ms Wells knows, that the, the next key step that we have to take is to bring a draft bill to this parliament uh, before next summer in order to create the legislative platform that we need in order to deliver benefits. In terms of uh, how and in what manner those benefits are then delivered and who might do that, that of course, as I think I've answered on previous occasions, is part of the option appraisal work that is currently going on to determine or to bring options uh, to ministers about exactly the shape and nature of the new Social Security Agency for Scotland. And uh, as that exercise reaches its conclusions in the early part of next year, then we will be taking decisions uh, on that basis and again, of course, informing Parliament. I do not accept, however, that um, personalisation of care and an approach that is based on the principles of dignity, fairness and respect is either a localised system or a nationalised system. I don't have that binary approach to this matter and I, I look forward to receiving the options that come to me from the uh, stage two option appraisal and considering what is the best mix that we could use to take forward in a way that is efficient for our public finances and ensures that the maximum amount of our expenditure goes on the benefits themselves. Question number six, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Glasgow City Council regarding the hostel for homeless men, the Belgrove Hotel. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, homelessness services are the responsibility of local authorities and addressing the needs of the residents of the Belgrove Hotel is therefore a matter for Glasgow City Council. However, uh, we are aware of the concerns around the Belgrove Hotel and my predecessor met with the leadership of Glasgow City Council to discuss this issue. 
Since being appointed as Minister, I have taken an interest in the issues associated with the Bell Grove, and I have asked officials to continue to engage with the Council on the Scottish Government's behalf. Discussions have focused particularly on strategically reviewing Glasgow's homelessness services. I know that this is an issue that Mr Mason has taken a close interest in, and think he will agree with me that the best interest of the Bell Grove's residents can only be met as part of a wider approach that helps to address issues such as rough sleeping and the provision of homelessness services for those with the most complex needs in Glasgow. John Meese. I yeah, thank the Minister for the reply. I mean, he will be aware, I expect, that the BBC did a documentary on this in the year 2000 and effectively nothing has happened of any real substance since then. There is no real inspection regime for the Belgrove Hotel. Would the Minister consider strengthening the powers of the Care Inspectorate to require them to inspect establishments like this? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I'm willing to consider if there's a future role for the Care Inspectorate uh, in the regulation of institutions like the Belgrove. However, the Belgrove Hotel is licensed as a house in multiple occupation, and Glasgow City Council has used the HMO licensing framework to require some improvements in the condition of the hotel. The priority, of course, is to ensure the well-being of the residents of the Belgrove Hotel and that their needs and wishes are considered. Um, it's not typical of other homeless accommodation in Scotland, uh, and this case involves very complex issues. I can assure Mr Mason uh, that I will continue to keep a close eye on this. I met this morning with representatives of Glasgow Homeless Network. Um, and he can be assured uh, that I will continue to look at all aspects of homelessness and rough sleeping in Glasgow. Question number seven, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government when it will set a new target to eradicate fuel poverty. Cabinet Secretary. We will consult on a new fuel poverty strategy, including a new fuel poverty target next year. This will first involve the commissioning of an independent review of the fuel poverty definition as recommended by the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group. So we ensure that we are setting the correct policy objectives and have the correct basis for targeting resources and measuring progress. And we also remain committed to our ambition of eradicating fuel poverty. Jackie Bailey. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of a small but welcome drop in fuel poverty, but there are still 738,000 people, one in five of the population of Scotland, having to choose between heating and eating. So setting a target to eradicate fuel poverty remains essential. Can I press her on when she will bring forward the strategy that will contain that target? And can the, the Cabinet Secretary also tell me whether, he'll be rev whether she will be reviewing the winter fuel payment and winter fuel allowance as part of that process? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we do have to uh, ensure that there is a, a synergy between what we do in social security and the work we do uh, in fuel poverty. Uh, and of course, there were some important uh, recommendations, more than 100 recommendations in the uh, reports from the two independent working groups, the, the one on the overall strategy and the one uh, on uh, rural fuel poverty as, as well. Um, can I say to Jackie Bailey that while uh, the latest statistics do show a welcome decrease of nearly 100,000 fewer households in fuel poverty. Uh, nonetheless, uh, as she articulated, that uh, means that 748,000 households continue to be fuel poor and that 203,000 uh, households uh, are in extreme uh, fuel poverty. So we do need to uh, progress the work at a pace. It has to be done properly. Uh, in my original answer, uh, I outlined work that has to be done over the course uh, of next year. So Mr Stewart, uh, prior to Christmas, will meet the Fuel Poverty Forum uh, next week to discuss the work done by the, the, the working groups. Uh, we will respond to the work done by the working groups uh, and uh, give our response at the beginning uh, of next year. Uh, in the first half of next year, uh, the work to look at the definition of fuel po poverty will have to commence and be completed. The next stage later on in the year is to introduce the strategy for consultation prior to uh, the Warms Homes Build uh, being introduced uh, in year two. And if there is uh, more detail that Ms Bailey uh, would like or appreciate, I'm happy to meet with her. Murder Fraser. Uh, thank you. The Scottish Government's budget next week gives it the opportunity to allocate some of the very generous 
uh, allocation of 800 million extra in capital from the UK government that's been passed on to it from the autumn statement to be uh, spent on uh, energy efficiency measures to help tackle fuel poverty. Uh, will it do so? Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, uh, fuel poverty has, or addressing fuel poverty and investing in measures to tackle fuel poverty has always been a priority uh, of this government. It's the same that that hasn't always been replicated uh, by the, the UK government, uh, who, if we remember, in June uh, 2015 uh, ceased the, the Green Deal scheme yeah. without uh, any warning, and that, of course, removed uh, £15 million in uh, consequentials. So as a government, we haven't uh, demurred from the importance of investment. From 2009 uh, onwards, we have invested £650 million. Uh, in our programme for government, we have the additional commitment uh, of a further half a billion pounds over uh, the lifetime of this parliament. But we have to remember that the biggest driver uh, of fuel poverty in terms of whether it decreases or increases is actually the price of domestic fuel. And fuel poverty in Scotland would be around 8% as opposed to 30% if it wasn't for the inflation busting uh, increases in domestic fuel. And it's a pity uh, that the UK government haven't done more to tackle uh, the rising costs of fuel. Absolutely. Question number eight, Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether money raised by local authorities should be kept in that area. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. All the money raised by local authorities through the council tax, non-domestic rates or locally set fees and charges is kept in their communities unless they choose to spend it elsewhere. Finlay Carson. Thank the Minister for that response. Since the SNP came to power, local authorities have been strangled by a government intent on centralisation, and this council tax grab is a further example of this. This government is happy to talk the talk about community empowerment, and for years the SNP have bleated on about the democratic deficit in the UK. Perhaps they should look at their erosion and the increasing deficit of local de democracy and accountability. And on that basis, can I ask the Minister whether the Government intend to centralise any more local authority spending? Minister. Um, President Officer, Mr Carson obviously didn't listen to the answer that I gave him. He talks of a council tax grab. The Scottish Government has been clear that all money raised through the council tax will, will remain in the local authority area that it is collected in. Just like, just like in 2011, we allowed all local authorities to keep their non-domestic rates. And of course, locally raised fees and charges uh, are also kept by local authorities. So I think that Mr. Carson uh, would, should pay due attention to the answers that he's given initially before coming up with a supplementary, which is way off the mark. John Mason. Does the Minister uh, agree with the Resolution Foundation when it stated that the SNP's tax increase would raise revenue in a progressive manner with the tax rise falling harder on higher income households? And would the Minister expand on how all local authorities receive their fair share of funding through a needs-based formula? Uh, I thank Mr Mason for that question and on his first point uh, I agree with the Resolution Foundation uh, as our reforms uh, to the council uh, tax will protect household incomes, make local taxation fairer and ensure local authorities continue to be properly funded while being uh, more accountable. Uh, on the second point that Mr Mason uh, makes, the needs-based formula takes into account population bandings, levels of deprivation, remoteness, including the extra cost of providing services to our island communities, and road links. This formula is kept under constant review jointly with COSLA to ensure it is as fair as it can possibly be. Question number nine, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many people in Scotland it estimates would be impacted by the UK Government reducing employment and support allowance to claimants placed in the work-related activity group. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you. The Scottish Government is, of course, very disappointed that the Chancellor didn't take the opportunity to reverse his proposals to cut employment and support allowance in his recent autumn statement. 
This is despite the House of Commons passing a motion calling for a pause in this proposed cut and the DWP's estimate that it will affect around 500,000 families across the UK. Those affected will see their support reduced from £102.15 per week to £73.10 when the cut is introduced in April 2017 for new claimants. Unfortunately, Employment Support Allowance is and will continue to remain fully reserved to the UK Government. Ben McPherson. Thank the Minister for that answer. Does the Minister agree with me that a cut of £30 a week for people who are unable to work, firstly, lacks any evidence base that it will move disabled people into work, secondly, will act as a real disincentive to disabled people trying to get back into work, and lastly, will only produce further hardship for disabled people and those with long-term health conditions? Minister. The cut that Mr um, McPherson refers to is, of course, a 28% reduction in the support for disabled people. And that from a government that tells us that it wants to help disabled people move into employment and indeed, indeed have that employment gap. It's hardly surprising that the report I referred to earlier uh, pointed out just how long it will take the UK government to meet the target that they claim to want to meet, but are doing so much to prevent themselves from even getting there. There is no evidence whatsoever that cutting benefits or imposing sanctions assists people or incentivizes them into employment. And indeed, the Sheffield Hallam uh, evidence that the Social Security Committee have recently uh, read and others, including the National Audit's Office's own report, all indicate that it is to the contrary, that cutting benefits and imposing sanctions further drive people into poverty and that in itself makes it very difficult for those individuals to then have the means by which to seek employment and to sustain employment and cutting further what limited uh, benefits there are to support them in that exercise seems to me utterly contradictory to the UK government's claimed approach but really is no surprising when one thinks about the ideology they operate from. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Minister, now that the Scottish Government has the top-up powers in this area, when will the Scottish Government tell us precisely how and when it will use these powers? Minister. Well, I have to say that was nothing if not predictable. Um, as, we have, as we have... Well, if, if the chaps over here would just pause for a moment, I will reply. We have made very clear the steps that we have to go through in order to deliver the benefits that will be devolved to us. We have also made clear in our manifesto in which we were elected and are now indeed the government in Scotland where we will use the top up powers and where we will introduce new benefits. To do anything in addition, of course, is a matter of political choices in a circumstance where the Scottish budget itself is significantly reduced by just uh, under around 10% over a number of years. And can I also make the point that what my colleagues on the left are arguing for is of course that people in Scotland should pay twice. Yes. Yeah. Once because uh, the UK government is choosing to make political choices that attack the most vulnerable, and secondly, in order to mitigate against that choice. We are already spending £100 million a year just to stand still and to mitigate against the worst effects of what their government is doing, and they continue to defend, and I really think it ill behoves them to argue that we should do more than that when really their sights should be trained on their own government to get them to stop the uh, policies that they're pursuing. Question number 10, Alison Harris. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what action it is taking in response to the findings of the independent review of the Scottish planning system. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you. Uh, since the independent panel's uh, report was published, we have undertaken a rigorous programme of work, including extensive stakeholder discussions and research. We are using this work to develop a package of reform, including le legislative change as well as wider actions that can be taken forward ahead of a planning bill. Alison Harris. Thank you, Minister. Does the Scottish Government accept that there should be a focus on reusing brownfield sites as one way of boosting house building in Scotland? Minister. 
Um, the Scottish Government will look at a, a number of things over the piece when it comes to the planning review. Um, we have invited more than 100 people to participate participate in six themed working groups. We've commissioned uh, research into infrastructure charging mechanisms, enforcement, 3D visualizations, and barriers to engagement. Uh, and we've also launched uh, a consultation on raising uh, planning fees. Uh, we will look at all aspects of planning, uh, and I hope that uh, many folk will engage during the course of uh, the consultation, which will begin uh, in early January. And I'm sure that uh, during the course uh, of that consultation, there will be discussions about use of brownfield sites. Question number 11, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the Westminster reduction in the benefit cap will have on disabled people and households in Scotland. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you. The Scottish Government has voiced its serious concerns about the impact of the new lower benefit cap, cap to the U UK Government. The benefit cap is and will remain, of course, reserved to the UK Government. The DWP estimate that the cap reduction will affect around 5,000 households in Scotland. However, a recent Chartered Institute of Housing report estimated the number affected in Scotland to be higher, with around 6,700 households containing more than 20,000 children. Whilst claimants of personal independence payment, disability living allowance and employment and support allowance support group are excluded from the cap, those placed in the work-related activity group of ESA may be subjected to it. James Dornan. I thank the Minister for that answer. During a recent visit to Shelter on the day the reduction of the welfare cap became effective, in fact, I witnessed a 7% increase in the volumes of calls Shelter received that morning. Does the Minister believe that this imposition of welfare cuts imposed by the UK Government will put people at further risk of homelessness? Minister. Yes, I do. I mean, what we have had even in the short space of this afternoon is, is a catalogue of cut after cut by the UK Government on those uh, least responsible for the current state of the UK economy uh, and least able to meet the demands placed on them. There is a clear risk of homelessness uh, as households struggle to make ends meet. We know that rent arrears are increasing, both as a result of the cuts to funding for temporary accommodation and as universal credit is rolled out. And this places many households at a heightened risk of homeliness, homelessness. We are working with COSLA and others to consider how temporary accommodation is provided in order to address these issues and will continue to raise our concerns about the impact of welfare cuts with the UK Government. Thank you. And that concludes portfolio questions. We're now going to move to the next amount of business, which is a debate in the name of Fergus Ewing on sea fisheries. And we'll just take a few moments to change seats for ministers to change seats.